Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 316 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about unicorns. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Unicorns are commonly understood to be horses that have a single horn emerging from their forehead. Today, they are a prominent part of pop culture. They appear in illustrations, many of them for children. They feature in books and cartoons and appear as costumes. They're often associated with rainbows and other emblems of cuteness. Some even say that unicorns poop rainbows, and they're associated with the New Age movement and other social movements. But despite their popularity today, unicorns have deep roots in the past, including a long association with the Christian faith. And modern ideas about unicorns are very different from those of the past. So what are unicorns? What did people believe about them? And could there be actual real unicorns? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Now, Jimmy, why did you want to start today's introductory segment with a discussion of how unicorns are understood today? Well, because a lot of currently popular ideas about unicorns are extremely recent. Uh, For example, the idea that they're associated with rainbows or that they even poop rainbows is extremely recent. In this episode, we're going to be going back into historic sources, and we'll see how different historical ideas about them were. Also, many people today assume that unicorns are nothing more than fantasy creatures, but, and, you know, that there's nothing in the real world that gave rise to the historical accounts of them. But people in the real world in the past were serious about unicorns, and there are multiple accounts of them by ancient naturalists. So today, in this episode, we're going to be doing a cryptid hunt or a hunt for hidden animals. We're going to be, go, we're going to be uh, asking about what, if anything, might be behind the basis of these historical accounts. Now, didn't you make a video about unicorns in the Bible several years ago? I did. Uh, I released a short video 11 years ago in 2012 about unicorns in the Bible, and we'll have a link to that video. We'll also discuss what I said in it. But since then, I've done a lot more research, and there is a lot more to say about unicorns than I knew then. I mean, wow, a lot more. The story is much deeper and more fascinating than I knew. So there will be a ton of new material compared to what was in that 10-minute video. In fact, there's so much to say about unicorns that this is going to be a two-parter. Today, we'll cover the background on unicorns, and then next week, we'll talk about them from the faith and reason perspectives and see what we can figure out about them. And you won't want to miss that because the conclusions I'm going to come to are not simple, predictable ones. We're going to have quite a few mysteries about unicorns to solve, and they will not all have the same answer, and certainly not... It's just a myth. There are historical bases for unicorns. So where do you want to begin today? As far back in history as possible, and then we'll walk forward towards the present in the background segment of today's mystery. How far back can we go? When did humans start talking about unicorns? Well, we don't really know, but it may well have been during the Stone Age before the invention of writing. Uh, One reason we can say this is that there is cave art that appears what that depicts what appears to be one horned creatures. But before we get to that, I want to make it clear that one of the most famous reported cave art unicorns isn't. Uh, and it's found in the Lascaux Cave in France. Uh, Lascaux Cave contains hundreds of examples of cave art, and they are estimated to date to around 17,000 years ago in the Paleolithic period or Old Stone Age. One of these images is called the Lascaux Unicorn, but despite that fact, the animal clearly has two horns coming from its head. They are unusually straight and project from its forehead, but there are clearly two of them, not one. Uh, The body of this animal is also strange, and it doesn't look like other creatures known to live in the area, but it clearly isn't a unicorn, so we're going to set that one aside. However, there's another image in the cave that some have also taken to be a unicorn. This image is clearly of a horse, 
but it does look like it's got a line or horn coming out of its forehead. Uh, however, the horse is bunched up against other pieces of art, and it isn't clear whether the line, which looks like it may extend behind the horse's head, isn't part of one of the other illustrations that the horse is bunched up with. So this one is quite shaky, and we can't safely conclude that it is anything other than a horse. But there is another French cave known as Rufignac Cave that has an image that is much more plausibly of a one-horned creature. This cave contains illustrations that have been estimated to date to around 11,000 BC. If th that date is accurate, it would place this cave art in the Mesolithic period or Middle Stone Age. Unfortunately, the illustration isn't much to look at. It's basically just a dark outline of a creature, and it's definitely not a horse. But on the left side of the illustration, it definitely has what looks like a large, single, curved horn. And we'll have more to say about this image and what it might represent uh, in the reason perspective. The period we've been discussing so far is prehistoric, meaning that writing hasn't yet been invented. But now let's move forward to the historical era where we have writing to go on. What's the earliest discussion of unicorns we know of? Some of the earliest written references may date to the Indus Valley civilization, which existed between about 3300 BC and 1300 BC. The Indus Valley civilization began just about the time that the Mesopotami Mesopotamians and Egyptians were starting to develop writing, and the Indus Valley civilization did have a writing system. It's known as the Indus Valley script or the Indus script. Unfortunately, while we have numerous examples of their own writing, which they inscribed on objects, nobody knows how to read it. We haven't found the equivalent of the Rosetta Stone that allowed us to crack Egyptian hieroglyphs. As a result, we can't read what members of the Indus Valley civilization were saying. But while we can't read the script, we can often make guesses because they often accompanied their written inscriptions with pictures, which presumably have some kind of relationship to the content of the written text. And here we're in luck because one of the most common Indus Valley images is of a unicorn. This is particularly, in com particularly common in seals that they use, like to seal documents. It's a very common theme. Now, this unicorn doesn't look like a horse, but like an ox or a cow. And it has one horn growing out of its forehead. Let me push back a bit here. Oxes and cows regularly have two horns. How do we know that this isn't just an ox or a cow being shown in profile so that its two horns appear as one? The same way that you only see one eye on an animal being shown in profile. Well, this is a very reasonable question. Uh, however, on various Indus Valley objects, the animal isn't shown in a full head-on profile. It's actually shown in a, a full dead-on profile. It's actually shown in a partial profile. So if you count them, you will see that the animal has four legs, whereas you'd only see two in a kind of stiff side-on profile. Despite that, the animal clearly has one horn, and we have other Indus seals showing oxen or cattle in the same kind of partial profile so that you can see they have four legs, and these images clearly have two horns. So the images that show four legs but only one horn emerging from the forehead really do appear to be unicorns, and like I said, this was a major theme in their artwork, so this was clearly an important animal to them either because it really existed or because they had legends about it. Let's look at an example where we can read the writing and where it's clearly referring to a unicorn. What's the earliest example we have of that? This is a little tricky, but you could argue that it's the Bible. Uh, people may be aware that a variety of Bible translations like the Catholic Douay Reims Bible and the Protestant King James Bible have a number of passages that refer to unicorns. So does the Latin Vulgate. Uh, each of those translations was made after the time of Christ, but the translation unicorn does appear before the time of Christ. So here are the relevant passages from the Greek Septuagint that refer to unicorns translated into English. The first one, Numbers 23-22, compares God's splendor to that of a unicorn. God, the one who brought them out of Egypt, as it were. The splendor of the unicorn is his. 
A chapter later in Numbers 24, 8, the text does the same thing. God led him out of Egypt like the splendor of the unicorn is his. In Deuteronomy 33, 17, Moses pronounces a blessing on the people of Joseph, the half-tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, and compares Joseph to a unicorn. A firstborn of a bull, his beauty. His horns are the horns of a unicorn. With them he shall gore nations as far as on the end of the earth. These are the myriads of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Then we hit the Psalms, and there are four references to unicorns there. In Psalm 21:22, which is actually Psalm 22 in most Bibles, the psalmist says, Save me from the mouth of the lion and my loneliness from the horn of the unicorn. In Psalm 28, 6, which is Psalm 29 in most Bibles, he says, And God will crush them, even Lebanon, as the young bull, and the beloved one will become as the offspring of the unicorn. In Psalm 77, verse 69, or 78, 69 in most Bibles, we read, And God built his unicorns, his sanctuary, in the land he founded it forever. In Psalm 91.11 or 92.10, the psalmist says, But my horn will be raised up as a unicorn, and my old age will be with good olive oil. And finally, we have a last reference to unicorns in Job 39 verses 9 to 12. God is pointing out Job's lowliness to him, and he says, And does the unicorn wish to serve you or to lie down by your trough? And will you tie its yoke by a thong? Or shall it pull furrows for you in the field? And have you placed trust in it because its strength is great? And will you put upon it your labors? And will you trust that it shall return the seed to you and bring it to your threshing floor? From these references, we can put together some basic facts about how the Septuagint conceptualizes the unicorn. It's a remarkable beast that's famed for its splendor, as we heard twice in the book of Numbers. Unicorns have prominent and powerful horns, as depicted in Deuteronomy and Psalm 22. Unicorns are apparently strong, for God built his sanctuary like one in Psalm 78. And in Psalm 92, the psalmist says that his strength, or horn, will be like that of a unicorn. Finally, in Job, we learn that unicorns are not domesticated, they will not serve man, they will not lie down by farmyard troughs, they will not be tied up, they will not pull plows, they will not bring seed to the threshing floor, but they are very strong. Now, in these passages, we are not told what conventional animal the unicorn most closely resembles, but we do have bulls mentioned in Deuteronomy and Psalm 29. The passage in Job also says that unicorns won't do the kind of work that bulls are used for. Uh, We also do have a juxtaposition with a lion, another strong animal, in Psalm 22, but the repeated references to bulls suggest that the Septuagint unicorn is some kind of ox-like or cow-like animal, like the one we see in the Indus Valley artifacts. And there is is no doubt that the Septuagint is using the word that means unicorn in this passage. Uh, The word in question is monokeros, or monokeros. Uh, Manos means only isolated or one, as in monotheism, meaning only one god. And keros means horn, so monokeros means an animal with only one horn. Then why did you say that, whether this is the first written record of a unicorn, is tricky? Because the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the Septuagint was begun in the 2nd century BC. If the term used in the original Hebrew also refers to a unicorn, then the books of the Bible, like Numbers and Deuteronomy, which were written about 1000 BC, would be the earliest records that I know of. So in the reason perspective, we'll have to return to the issue of whether the Hebrew word means unicorn or not. Are there other references to unicorns in works written between the Hebrew originals and the translation of the Septuagint? Yeah, and the earliest I'm familiar with is that of the Greek author and physician Catasias of Cnidus. Uh, He wrote about 398 BC, and he said some very interesting things about unicorns. There are in India certain wild asses which are as large as horses and larger. Their bodies are white, their heads dark red, and their eyes dark blue. 
They have a horn on the forehead, which is about a foot and a half in length. The base of this horn, for some two hands breadth above the brow, is pure white. The upper part is sharp in a vivid crimson, and the remainder or middle portion is black. Those who drink out of these horns, made into drinking vessels, are not subject, they say, to convulsions or to holy disease, that is, epilepsy. Instead, they are immune even to poisons if, either before swallowing such, they drink wine, water, or anything else from these beakers. Other asses, both the tame and the wild, and in fact all animals with solid hoofs, are without ankle bones and have no gall in the liver. But these have both the ankle bone and the gall. This ankle bone, the most beautiful I have ever seen, is like that of an ox in general appearance and in size. But it is as heavy as lead, and its color is that of cinnabar, that is red, through and through. The animal is exceedingly swift and powerful, so that no creature, neither the horse nor any other, can overtake it. When it starts to run, it goes slowly, but it gradually increases its speed wonderfully, and the further it goes, the swifter. This is the only way to capture them. When they take their young to pasture, you must surround them with many men and horses. They will not desert their offspring, and they will fight with horn, teeth, and heels, and they kill many horses and men. They are themselves brought down by arrows and spears. They cannot be caught alive. The flesh of this animal is so bitter that it cannot be eaten. It is hunted for its horn and ankle bone. Here, Catasia says that unicorns come from India, as suggested by the Indus Valley artifacts. Uh, and he says they're like wild asses, that is, donkeys, only quite a bit larger than normal, even larger than horses. Unlike regular donkeys and other creatures with solid hoofs, they also have an ankle bone and they have gall in their livers. They start running slowly but build up speed and become very swift. They are very powerful and they are fierce and will fight using their horns, teeth, and heels. They are capable of killing human beings and we have to use special techniques to kill them because you can't take them alive. Cups are made out of their horns, and these cups have unusual medical properties like granting immunity from convulsions, epilepsy, and poison. Later in the 300s BC, the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle also had a brief discussion of unicorns. In his History of Animals, he writes, Of animals, some are horned and some are not so. The great majority of the horned animals are cloven-footed, as the ox, the stag, the goat, and a solid-hoofed animal with a pair of horns has never yet been met with. But a few animals are known to be single-horned and single-hoofed, as the Indian ass, and one, to wit, the oryx, is single-horned and cloven-hoofed. Of all the single-hoofed animals, the Indian ass alone has an astragalus, or hucklebone. History of Animals, 2-1, 499b, 15-20. Here, Aristotle doesn't use the exact word monokeros, uh, but he says that the Indian ass or donkey is a monokerata, or one-horned animal. And he notes that it has a huckle bone, or what is uh, known as the astragalus bone, which in humans is often called the ankle bone or talus bone. Each of these points fits with what Catasia said, that unicorns are from India, they have one horn, that they resemble donkeys, and that unlike donkeys, they have ankle bones. Other ancient discussion, or another ancient discussion of the unicorn is found in the ancient Roman author and natural philosopher Pliny the Elder. He wrote a 37-volume work, which is basically an encyclopedia, called Natural History. The first 10 volumes were published just before his death, and his nephew, Pliny the Younger, published the rest after his death. Pliny the Elder was a really curious guy, and his death is interesting because it may have been an example of curiosity killing the cat. Listeners will have heard of Mount Vesuvius in Italy and how in AD 79, Volcano Day arrived and it blew its top, destroying and burying the towns of Pompeii and Herculaneum where we have discovered some evidence of early Christian communities, as we'll discuss in a future episode. In any event, Pliny the Elder saw the eruption of Vesuvius and went there. Later, his nephew, Pliny the Younger, wrote to the Emperor Tacitus and said, Your request that I would send you an account of my uncle's end deserves my acknowledgments. He was at the time with the fleet under his command at Mycenaeum, 
On the 24th of August, about one in the afternoon, my mother desired him to observe a cloud of very unusual size and appearance. He had sunned himself, then taken a cold bath, and after a leisurely luncheon was engaged in study. He immediately called for his shoes and went up an eminence from which he might best view this very uncommon appearance. It was not at that distance discernible from what mountain this cloud issued, but it found afterwards to be Vesuvius. I cannot give you a more exact description of its figure than by resembling it to that of a pine tree, for it shot up a great height in the form of a trunk which extended itself at the top into several branches. Pliny the Younger is here describing what we today would call a mushroom cloud. Uh, mushroom clouds uh, can be caused by any large explosion, not just nuclear bombs. And volcanoes can cause them. In fact, in the video version of the podcast, we'll have a photograph of a volcanic mushroom cloud. Pliny the Younger speculates on why the mushroom cloud took the shape it did. But we understand the physics of them better today, so I'll just tell you. Basically, the hot gases and material of the explosion rises in the atmosphere until it reaches a point of equilibrium, and it then starts expanding outward like a cloud. That generates the cap or top of the mushroom shape. At the same time, expanding hot light material in the cloud creates a zone of lighter density, and that sucks up a shaft of air, including dirt and debris from below. That forms the shaft or stalk of the mushroom. Now, back to our story about Pliny the Elder. My uncle, true savant that he was, deemed the phenomenon important and worth a nearer view. He ordered a light vessel to be got ready and gave me the liberty, if I thought proper, to attend him. I replied that I would rather study. As he was coming out of the house, he received a note from Rectina, the wife of Bassus, who was at the utmost alarm at the imminent danger. His villa stood just below us, and there was no way to escape but by sea. She earnestly entreated him to save her from such deadly peril. He changed his first design, and what he began with a philosophical turn of mind, he pursued with a heroical turn of mind. He ordered large galleys to be launched and went himself on board one with the intention of assisting not only Rectina, but many others. For the villas stand extremely thick upon that beautiful coast. Hastening to the place from whence others were flying, he steered his direct course to the point of danger. And with such freedom of fear as to be able to make and dictate his observations upon the successive motions and figures of that terrific object. So Plint the Elder rushed towards the danger and dictated his observations about the volcanic spectacle he was seeing unfolding before him, presumably to preserve them for posterity in what was the ancient equivalent of modern science. So quite a curious guy. And now cinders, which grew thicker and hotter the nearer he approached, fell into the ships. Then pumice stones, too, with stones blackened, scorched, and cracked by fire. Then the sea abetted suddenly from under them, while the shore was blocked up by landslides from the mountains. At this point, Pliny the Elder considered whether he should turn back, and the captain of one of his ships was urging him to do so. But he turned to the captain and said a line that has become a famous saying. There's an old saying, fortune favors the bold. Well, I guess we're about to find out. So yeah, Pliny the Elder was the fortune favors the bold guy. Unfortunately, as brave as he was, fortune didn't favor the Roman philosopher. Things went badly for him after he had ordered the captain of the ship to take him to his friend, the Roman senator Pomponianus. Pomponianus was then at Stabiae, distant by half the width of the Bay of Naples. He had already embarked his baggage, for though at Stabiae the danger was not yet near, it was in full view and certain to be extremely near as soon as it spread. And he resolved to fly as soon as the contrary wind should cease. It was full favorable, however, for carrying my uncle to Pompeianus. Upon arriving, he embraces, comforts, and encourages his alarmed friend. And in order to soothe the other's fears by his own unconcern, desires to be conducted to a bath. And after having bathed, he sat down to supper with great cheerfulness, or at least, which is equally heroic, with all the appearance of it. In the meanwhile, Mount Vesuvius was blazing in several places with spreading and towering flames, whose refulgent brightness the darkness of the night set in high relief. 
but my uncle, in order to soothe apprehensions, kept saying that some fires had been left alight by the terrified country people, and what they saw were only deserted villas on fire in the abandoned district. After this, he retired to rest, and it is most certain that his rest was a most genuine slumber. For his breathing, which, as he was pretty fat, was somewhat heavy and sonorous, was heard by those who attended at his chamber door. But the court which led to his apartment now lay so deep under a mixture of pumice stones and ashes that if he had continued longer in his bedroom, egress would have been impossible. On being aroused, he came out and returned to Pompeianus and the others who had sat up all night. They consulted together as to whether they should hold out in the house or wander out into the open. For the house now tottered upon repeated and violent concussions and seemed to rock to and fro as if torn from its foundations. In other words, the house was being rocked by earthquakes caused by the ongoing volcanic eruption. In the open air, on the other hand, they dreaded the falling pumice stones, light and porous though they were. Yet this, by comparison, seemed the lesser danger of the two, a conclusion which my uncle arrived at by balancing reasons and the others by balancing fears. Pliny thus concluded that it was more dangerous to stay in the house because of the earthquakes, which might collapse it, and venturing out and braving the falling pumice stones from the sky was better. He concluded this by his scientific reason, but the others concluded it because of their naked fear, and so they decided to leave the house. They tied pillows upon their heads with napkins, and this was their whole defense against the showers that fell round them. It was now day everywhere else, but there was a deeper darkness prevailed than in the most obscure night, relieved, however, by many torches and divers' illuminations. They thought proper to go down upon the shore and to observe from close at hand if they could possibly put out to sea, but they found the waves still ran extremely high and contrary. The waves, of course, being extremely high due to the earthquakes. There my uncle, having thrown himself down upon the disused sail, repeatedly called for and drank a draft of cold water. Soon after, flames and a strong smell of sulfur, which was the forerunner of them, dispersed the rest of the company in flight. Him they only aroused. He raised himself up with the assistance of two of his slaves, but instantly fell. Some unusually gross vapor, as I conjecture, having obstructed his breathing and blocked his windpipe, which was not only naturally weak and constricted, but chronically inflamed. When day dawned again, the third from that he last beheld, his body was found entire and uninjured, and it was still fully clothed as in life. Its posture was that of a sleeping rather than a dead man. Letters 616. So Pliny the Younger speculates that his uncle was killed by a poison vapor or gas released by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, but he really doesn't know that. It's just speculation. All that they know is that he died during the course of these events. Some authors have speculated that he may have died of a stroke or a heart attack or by breathing poison vapors like his nephew thought. But for our purposes, the reason he was there is more significant. His nephew, Pliny the Younger, mentions that his uncle approached Vesuvius because of his scientific curiosity, but he also mentions a desire to save other people, like Rectina, the wife of Bassus, and his friend Pomponianus. But the Roman historian Suetonius attributes Pliny's death only to his scientific curiosity, right? He was commanding the fleet of Mycenaeum and settled out in a Liburnium galley during the eruption of Vesuvius to investigate the causes of the phenomenon from nearer at hand. He was unable to return because of the headwinds. He was suffocated by the shower of dust and ashes, although some think he was killed by a slave, whom he begged to hasten his end when he was overcome by the intense heat. Lives of Illustrious Men So maybe Pliny the Elder died because curiosity killed the cat. Now, here is what Pliny the Elder says about the unicorn in his natural history. Dorsean Indians hunt down a very fierce animal called the Monercaras, which has the head of the stag, the feet of the elephant, and the tail of the boar, while the rest of the body is like that of a horse. It makes a deep blowing sound and has a single black horn which projects from the middle of its forehead two cubits in length. This animal, it is said, cannot be taken alive. Natural History 831. 
This description is worth reviewing because Pliny does not compare the unicorn to a single beast like a horse or bull or donkey. Instead, he gives us descriptions of its individual body parts. The head is like that of a stag or a male deer. The feet are like those of an elephant. The tail is like that of a boar. And the body is like that of a horse. It also has a single horn in the middle of its forehead. And notice that Pliny also states that it is from India, as other sources have indicated, and that it's fierce and allegedly cannot be captured alive. Because of how famous he was as a naturalist and author, Pliny's description became quite influential, and many later writers seem to use elements of it in their own discussion of unicorns. We're now turning from the classical age to the Christian age. What's the earliest Christian discussion of unicorns that you're aware of? The earliest substantial one that I'm aware of is found in a book called The Physiologus. Uh, it was originally written in Greek in Alexandria, Egypt, sometime between the 2nd and the 4th centuries, so between the AD 100s and 300s, let's just say the 200s. It was extremely popular and was translated into many languages, and it's a book about the wonders of nature, which it gives allegorical theological interpretations to. This is something that Christians did all the time back in the day. We talked about it some in episode 284 on the Question Beast, and in his book, The Natural History of Unicorns, British scholar Chris Lavers quotes another author, Roger French, discussing why they did this. French says... For the Christian, God was so important that everything in his creation signified him. Parts of creation became symbolic of God's actions. The natures of animals are allegories of God. Perhaps indeed, thought the Christians, they have put into the world for that very purpose, to represent aspects of God's creation and remind man of his creator. If it was assumed, as some Christians did, that the lion was symbolic of the devil, then it gave added understanding to the biblical statement to this effect if one knew about the nature and actions of lions, which meant that looking at the natural world or reading about it was a religious affair, if not an actual Christian duty. So Christian authors were always on the lookout to see what they could deduce about God and the spiritual life from the animals and plants that they saw in the world. And the phys physiologist offers an allegorical interpretation of the unicorn, as well as telling us about the animal. It says, Unicornus. The unicorn is of the following nature. He is a very small animal like a kid, exceedingly swift, with one horn in the middle of his forehead, and no hunter can catch him. But he can be trapped by the following stratagem. A virgin girl is led to where he lurks, and there she is sent off by herself into the wood. He soon leaps into her lap when he sees her and embraces her, and hence gets caught. So that's the data about the animal. Now, here comes the allegorization. And the lesson. Our Lord Jesus Christ is also a unicorn spiritually, about whom it is said, and he was beloved like the son of the unicorns. And in another psalm, he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his son David. The fact that it is just one horn on its head means what he himself said, I and the Father are one. And according to the apostle, the head of Christ is the Lord. It says that he is very swift because neither principalities, nor powers, nor thrones, nor dominations could keep up with him, nor could hell contain him nor could the most subtle devil prevail to catch or comprehend him. But by the sole will of the Father, he came down into the virgin womb for our salvation. It is described as a tiny animal on account of the loneliness of his, Jesus' incarnation. As he himself said, learn from me, because I am mild and lowly of heart. It is like a kid or scapegoat, because the Savior himself was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, and from sin he condemned sin. The unicorn often fights with elephants and conquers them by wounding them in the belly. According to the physiologist, the unicorn is a small animal, like a kid, meaning a young goat. Uh, and it has one horn in the middle of its forehead, and it's very fast, so it can't be caught by a hunter. But there is a way you can lure it into a trap. And vari variations on this stratagem are repeatedly described in numerous Christian works. 
basically you take a young woman, a virgin, and you have her wait outdoors. And when the unicorn sees her, it will lose its fierceness and lay down its head. And then suddenly the hunters can spring out and capture it. In some versions of the story, the virgin bears her chest, and in some she lets the unicorn suckle. But one way or another, it gets captured. In some versions, the hunters kill it, but in many versions, they then take the unicorn to the palace of the local king. And wow, is this a common story in this period. You, you see it not only in multiple literary works, you also see it in picture after picture after picture of unicorns. The physiologist then gives us what becomes the standard allegorical interpretation of the unicorn. The unicorn itself represents Jesus Christ, who is so swift and powerful that he can't be caught by any demonic forces. But by the will of God, he nevertheless enters the world through the womb of the Virgin Mary, so that the Virgin in the unicorn catching story represents the Virgin Mary. And all of this is the will of God the Father, who is the king, to whose palace the unicorn is then taken in some versions of the story. And the hunters who show up and catch the unicorn are often understood as symbols of people coming to Christ for salvation. They thus catch the unicorn or embrace the Christian faith. At least that's the standard version of the, or standard interpretation of the story that shows up all the time. But Another interpretation was offered by Pope St. Gregory the Great, um, also known as Pope St. Gregory I. He reigned between A.D. 590 and 604. Since uh, the book of Job discusses unicorns, Pope Gregory discusses them in his work, Morals in Job. And here I'm going to suppress one word that Pope Gregory uses because it's a spoiler for something we're going to cover later on. He writes, This creature which is called also the monokeros in Greek copies, is said to be of such great strength as not to be taken by any skill of hunters. But as those persons assert who have striven with laborious investigation in describing the nature of animals, a virgin is placed before it who opens to it her bosom as it approaches, in which, having put aside all its ferocity, it lays down its head, and is thus suddenly found as if it were unarmed by those whom it is sought to be taken. It is also described as being of box color, and whenever it engages with elephants, it is said to strike with that single horn, which it bears on its nostrils, the belly of its opponents, in order to easily overthrow its assailants when it wounds their softer parts. By this creature, or certainly Monokeros, that is, the unicorn, can therefore be understood that people who, when it adopted, not good works, but merely pride among all men, as its reception of the law, carried, as it were, a singular horn among other beasts. Whence the Lord, foretelling his passion by the voice of the prophet, says, Save me from the lion's mouth, and my humility from the horns of the unicorns. Psalms 22. 21. For as many unicorns existed in that nation, as many as were those who with singularly and foolish pride confided in the works of the law, in opposition to the preaching of the truth. It is said, therefore, to blessed Job as a type of the church. Morals in Job 631, 15, 29. Here, Pope Gregory mentions that the unicorn is called a monokeros in Greek, or Monoceros, to give it a more English pronunciation via Latin. He says that it has a box color, meaning the color of boxwood, which is a kind of light brown or yellow brown, like the lumber that you can make boxes out of. He says that it's very strong and can't be taken by the skill of ordinary hunters, but he describes a way you can catch it, which again involves a virgin pacifying the animal so that the hunters can get it. Gregory then indulges in some theological alleg allegorization, but his interpretation is quite different. Pope Gregory interprets unicorns allegorically as a symbol of the Jewish people. Unicorns have one prominent horn, making them distinct among other animals, and the Jewish people were unique in being God's chosen people, distinct from other people's. So Gregory says they were proud like unicorns, and they would end up crucifying the Messiah, which Gregory sees reflected in the text of Psalm 22, where the psalmist Christologically prays, save me from the horns of the unicorns. 
Despite the fact that this was Gregory's interpretation, and he was Pope, in fact one of the few to be called the Great, this was far from the most common interpretation of unicorns in Christian circles, which saw the unicorn as a symbol of Jesus and the Virgin as a symbol of Mary. And before we continue with our discussion, I want to take a moment here to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Father Thomas L., Ben H., Gareth H., Gary J., and Christopher P. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. I mean, Pope Gregory the Great reigned around the year 600, which was technically in the Middle Ages. But it wasn't the High Middle Ages, which stretched from about 1000 to 1300. That was a very productive period with many Christian thinkers writing. What were Christians saying about unicorns then? I'd like to focus on what two authors said about unicorns. The first is St. Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, she lived between about uh, 1098 and 1179, and wow, is she impressive. She was a saint, a theologian, a mystic, and a doctor of the church. She also wrote on a ton of interesting things, and we'll definitely be discussing her more in future episodes. One of her books is a work called Physica, which is a book about science and medicine, and in it, she has a section on unicorns. She writes, The unicorn, unicornus, is more hot than cold. Its strength is greater than its heat. It eats clean plants. In moving, it has a leap, and it flees humans and other animals, except those that are of its kind, and so it cannot be captured. It especially fears a man and shuns him. Just as the serpent in the first fall shunned the man and got to know the woman, so this animal avoids a man but follows a woman. There was a certain philosopher who scrutinized the natures of animals, and he marveled greatly that capturing this animal by any skill was impossible. One day he went hunting, as he usually did, and was accompanied by men, women, and girls. The girls walked separately from the others and played among the flowers. Seeing the girls, a unicorn shortened its leaps and gradually drew near. It sat on its hind legs, diligently gazing at them from afar. The philosopher, seeing this, thought hard about it. He understood that a unicorn could be captured by girls. He approached it from the back and caught it by means of the girls. A unicorn, seeing a girl from afar, wonders that she has no beard but does have the shape of a person. If two or three girls are together, it is more amazed, and it is caught more quickly when its eyes are fixed on them. The girls, by whose means the unicorn is captured, must be nobles, not country girls. They should be neither completely grown nor entirely small, but in the midst of adolescence. The unicorn loves them because it knows they are gentle and sweet. Once a year it goes to the land that has the water of paradise. There it seeks the best plants, which it digs up with its hooves and eats. From them it has great powers, but it still flees other animals. It has beneath its horn something as clear as glass, so that in it a person can look at his own face as if looking in a mirror. Nevertheless, it is not very valuable. Pulverize the liver of a unicorn and put this powder in fat prepared from the yolk of an egg, making an ointment. There is no leprosy of any kind that will not be cured if you often anoint it with this ointment, unless death is present for the one who has it or God does not wish to cure it. The liver of this animal has good heat and cleanliness in it, and the fat in the egg yolks is the most precious thing in an egg and is just like an ungent. 
Leprosy very often is from black bile and from overabundant black blood. From unicorn skin, make a belt. Gird yourself with it against your skin, and no strong disease or fever will harm your insides. Also, make shoes from its skin and wear them. You will always have healthy feet, legs, and loins. No disease will harm you in these places. A person who fears being killed by poison should put unicorn hoof under the dish where his food is or under the cup containing his drink. If they are hot and there is poison in them, it will make them boil in their vessel. If they are cold, it will make them smoke, and he will be able to tell there is no poison in them. Other parts of the unicorn are not suitable for medicine. Physica 7-5. Because this is a medical text, Hildegard pays particular attention to medical applications of unicorn parts. Her discussion of things being hot or cold and her discussion of black bile and black blood are connected with her overall theory of medicine. And she lists a number of medical applications for unicorn parts, including using its horn to detect poison, which is consistent with things we've heard before. She also gives another account of how to catch unicorns using girls, and I find her account more plausible than some of the others. Uh, She doesn't attribute it to some magical property of virgins. Instead, she tries to give a naturalistic account of why the unicorn would be pacified by adolescent girls from the nobility. She says it senses their sweetness and gentleness, uh, these being qualities that were particularly cultivated among young noblewomen. And frankly, girls that grew up rich and well-fed would have better access to food and medical care, so young noble girls would probably be more attractive, at least to human eyes, than girls that grew up living in hard, impoverished farming lives. I also find it interesting that she thinks the unicorn is amazed by the fact that girls don't have beards and nevertheless look human. Uh, You can just imagine what the unicorn is thinking. I mean, what? They look human, but they don't have beards? What is going on here? Um, I find this a rather humorous explanation, but it's the one that Hildegard proposed. (laughs) So who is the second writer of the period you wanted to cover? It's St. Albert the Great or Albertus Magnus. Uh, He lived between about 1200 and 1280. He was the teacher of St. Thomas Aquinas, but he's also a genius saint, theologian, and doctor of the church in his own right. And he also wrote on all kinds of interesting subjects. One of his works is a huge book called On Animals, which is basically an encyclopedia all about animals. In it, he discusses unicorns in a few places, and basically, he's describing three different types of unicorns. Here's the first. Monoceros. They gave the name Monoceros unicorn to an animal that is composed from many animals. It has a terrifying bellow, the body of a horse, the feet of an elephant, a pig's tail, the head of a deer, and in the middle of its forehead it bears a horn, which is beautiful for its wondrous splendor. The horn is four feet long and is so sharp that it easily pierces everything it strikes with one blow. The animal is almost never able to be tamed and hardly ever comes into the power of men while still alive, for seeing itself beaten, it kills itself in a rage. On Animals, 2271-119. Here, Albert's description of the unicorn is clearly related to Pliny the Elders. Uh, he names the same animals that Pliny does in describing the body parts of a unicorn. And Albert gives an interesting reason why you can't take the animal alive. Basically, if it gets caught, it goes into such a rage that it injures itself and dies. The second passage is this one. Onager. Indicus, that is, the Indian wild ass. The Indian onager, Indian wild ass, is different from the one just mentioned, that is, the African one. It has great size and strength and bears a huge horn in the middle of its forehead. As if by way of displaying its courage, this animal sometimes breaks rocks off cliffs for no other reason than as demonstration of its strength. It has very sharp, solid hooves. On Animals 2284-126. Here, Albert gives a description of a donkey-like beast that has one horn and is native to India, in keeping with some of the other descriptions that we've heard. Finally, we come to Albert's third type of unicorn. Unicornus. 
The unicorn is an animal that has but moderate size for its strength. It has a boxwood-like color, and the hoof part of its foot, ungula pedis, is split into two parts. It lives in mountains or in deserts and has a very long horn on its forehead, which it sharpens on rocks, and with which it pierces even the elephant. Neither does it fear the hunter. Pompey the Great exhibited this animal in the games at Rome. They say, however, that this animal respects virgin girls so much that when it sees them it grows tame and is sometimes captured and bound in a trance near them. It is also captured when it is a young animal and is tamed in this way. On Animals 22-106-144. So this is the type of unicorn that Albert has heard can be pacified by virgins, and he says it lives in mountains or deserts. We've now looked at the views of multiple historical authors about what unicorns were. What more should we cover about them? One thing that emerged in Europe in late medieval and Renaissance times was physical evidence for the existence of unicorns. It was a substance that is today commonly called alicorn. Uh, this term was popularized in the 20th century by the author Odell Shepard. And basically, an alicorn is a unicorn horn. Uh, he populi- popularized this term so that you don't have to keep saying unicorn horn over and over again. But basically, at the period in history we've now reached, alicorns or unicorn horns were showing up all over Europe and in the Middle East. In The Natural History of Unicorns, Chris Lavers writes, The term is based on the old Italian word alicorno, which seems to have been born of three parents, Arabic, all, for the, French Romance, li, for the, and Latin, cornus, for the horn. The double definite article was no doubt accidental, but the emphasis is fitting, the horn. In late medieval and Renaissance times, alicorn was among the most sought-after commodities in Europe. Many alicorns circulated during this period, often passing as prestige gifts from one royal house to another. Some of these noble horns were donated to churches, and on occasion the church stooped to outright purchase. By such means did most of Europe's alicorns end up in the hands of royalty or the clergy, where most examples remain. Prices quoted for alicorns vary greatly, and one wonders how seriously to take many of them. In 1609, Thomas Decker reckoned the value of a single horn at half a city, presumably an estimate intended to express wonder rather than any useful information. In 1553, an alicorn owned by the King of France is valued at 20,000 pounds, a figure that may be accurate or an illustration of the centuries-old competition between European royal families to be seen as the most magnificent. Half a century later, the Great Horn of Windsor, one of several alicorns owned by the British royal family, was valued at 100,000 pounds. When the alicorn bubble was fully expanded, a complete horn was worth 20 times its weight in gold. Even diced or powdered, alicorns were ten times its weight in gold. So when we get to the faith and reason sections, we're going to need to explain what these alicorns were, as they were some kind of physical evidence for unicorns, not just stories or literary accounts. Here's one description of what one alicorn looked like. The alicorn in question was owned by King Charles I of England, and it's recounted in a book from 1607 called History of Four-Footed Beasts by Reverend Edward Topsell. He writes, I never saw anything in any creature more worth of praise than its horn. The substance is made by nature, not art, wherein all the marks are found with the true horn requireth. It is of so great a length that the tallest man can scarcely touch the top thereof, for it doth fully equal seven feet. It weigheth thirteen pounds. The figure doth plainly signify a wax candle being folded and wreathed within itself, being far more thicker from one part, and making itself by little and little less toward the point. The splints, that is, the outgrowths of bone, of the spire are smooth and not deep being for the most part like unto the wreathing turnings of snails or the revolutions of woodbine about any wood. But they proceed from the right hand toward the left, from the beginning of the horn even unto the very end. By the weight it is easy to conjecture that this beast which can bear so great a burden in its head in the quantity of his body can be little less than a great ox. 
So here, Reverend Topsell tells us that the alicorn was seven feet long and weighed 13 pounds, which meant it wasn't very heavy for its length. And since it was made of bone, it must have been very narrow. The reverend says that it looked like a wax candle, and he says it was thicker in one part, the base of the horn, than it was in another location, the point of the horn. Despite the fact that it only weighed 13 pounds, that would be a lot to carry around on your head, and he estimates the size of the animal it came from must have been at least the size of an ox, not something small like a goat, like the physiologist said. He also gives a very interesting detail about how the horn was constructed. He said it had smooth but not deep outgrowths of bone that he says were twisted, like the turnings of a snail shell, only extending a long way up to a seven-foot point. The appearance in Europe of these alicorns in in late medieval times then had an impact on art. Prior to that point, you could see different kinds of horns, some of which were curved, some of which were black or a mix of colors. But after the appearance of the alicorns, everybody started painting pictures of unicorns with straight, white, twisted horns. Chris Lavers writes, Agreement was reached about the archetypal nature of alicorn at an early stage, at least among the devout. White or ivory-colored spirally twisted horns of the type described by Top Cell began to appear on the foreheads of unicorns in Christian art around the year 1200. Within a century or so, alicorns of this kind had become the iconographic standard. From the 13th century onwards, they were invariably described as unicorn horns in royal and ecclesiastical records. A few alicorns are known from inventories from the 12th to the 14th centuries, and many more from the 15th and 16th. So it seems likely that Christian artists remodeled the unicorn in response to an influx of new or previously rare biological artifacts. So this seems to be what cemented the idea of unicorns having long, straight, white, twisty horns. We've now covered the Renaissance era, which was between the 1400s and 1500s, and we've even gotten into the early modern period from the 1500s to the 1800s. It was during this period in the 1600s that the scientific revolution occurred. How did unicorns fare after the development of modern science? Well, not particularly well. Under the influence of the rationalism of the Enlightenment, many intellectuals came to regard unicorns as simply mythical creatures, because nobody in modern Europe had ever seen one. But then a scientific argument emerged against their existence. One of the key figures in the scientific revolution was the French scientist and baron Georges Cuvier. He lived between 1769 and 1832, and he's one of the key figures in the development of modern biology, along with Darwin and a few others. He's like one of the key guys. His major work is known as the Animal Kingdom, and he's also known as the founding father of paleontology because he was an expert in fossils and compared them to modern animals. And he was one of the first to propose the age of the dinosaurs, that dinosaurs ruled the earth in prehistoric times, though he understood dinosaurs to be reptiles, and we now know many of them were warm-blooded. Interestingly, Cuvier opposed evolution, and he thought he engaged in a famous debate on the subject, uh, arguing against evolution and in favor of the idea of cyclical creations of new life forms following major extinction events, such as massive floods. He comes into the unicorn story because of an argument that he came up with. The argument concerned why unicorns shouldn't exist. Lavers writes, The ensuing enlightenment, a catch-all term for the culture of rationalism that came to dominate scholastic thinking in the 18th century, was bad news for the unicorn. Speculations about a creature widely thought to be mythical had no place in an intellectual system rooted in reason. Worse, the French scientist Baron Georges Cuvier, the Newton of biology, reasoned that unicorns were anatomically all but impossible. In his vast experience of living in fossil animals, he had encountered neither a symmetrical horn nor one that attached to a suture between two bones, let alone to the frontal suture of the skull from where a unicorn's horn would have to grow. Cuvier was too smart and cautious to state that one-horned quadrupeds cannot exist— New categories of creatures might be discovered, animals are sometimes born with deformities, and he was a scientist. But the implication of his reasoning was clear. The time as scholars and explorers would be better spent on less trivial pursuits. 
Cuvier's skepticism triumphed in the universities of Europe, but travelers were less easily swayed. Explorers were discovering more of the world's geography, and some recounted exaggerated experience of foreign landscapes, peoples, and animals. Scholars did their best to ignore these new tales, but the rapidly growing literate population of Europe found them harder to resist. Even better for unicorns, in the late 18th and 19th centuries, an outlook on the world developed that offered more scope for wonders than Enlightenment scholars had been willing to concede. So the intellectuals and the natural philosophers, the guys who would come to be called scientists in the 1800s, were now throwing shade on unicorns. But there was still a lot of popular fascination with them. After all, not all of the planet had been explored yet. Uh, New creatures were being discovered all the time. And unicorns might be lurking in some part of the globe that Western explorers hadn't reached yet. Interestingly, while many historical accounts located the unicorn in India, or at least somewhere in Asia, there were new reports of unicorns coming out of Africa, which was still largely unexplored by Westerners. Africans were telling them that, in fact, unicorns existed there, and this led to a major unicorn unicorn hunt and expedition in 1899, which will be what we close our background section with today. First, though, I'd like to make a brief detour and talk about how this unicorn hunt relates to a famous incident. One of the key African explorers of this period was a man named David Livingston. He lived uh, from 1813 to 1873. He was Scottish, as well as a physician, a Christian missionary, and an explorer. During the course of his career, he explored the headwaters of African rivers like the Nile, the Congo, and the Zambezi. One of the reasons was he wanted to find the source of the Nile so that he could get famous, but not for his own sake. He wanted to become famous so that he could have a platform and then use his voice against the African slave trade and end African slavery in the West. So good on him. However, While he was exploring the interior of Africa, he was out of contact with Europeans for about six years, and many thought that he'd simply been lost. He also got really sick, but he pressed on in his explorations. Wikipedia reports, Livingston completely lost contact with the outside world for six years and was ill for most of the last four years of his life. Only one of his 44 letter dispatches made it to Zanzibar. One surviving letter to Horace Waller was made available to the public in 2010 by its owner, Peter Beard. It reads, I am terribly knocked up, that is sick, but this is for your own eye only. Doubtful if I live to see you again. Meanwhile, back in the Western world, people were concerned about Livingston apparently being lost, and the newspaper, um, the New York Herald, issued a challenge to go and find Livingston. Responded to this challenge was Sir Henry Morton Stanley. He lived between 1841 and 1904, so he was almost 30 years younger than Livingston, and he was a Welsh American, explorer, and journalist. Stanley took up the challenge of finding Livingston, and in 1871, he found him near Lake Tanganyika, one of Africa's great lakes uh, inside of modern Tanzania. He described their meeting this way. I would have run to him, only I was a coward in the presence of such a mob. Would have embraced him, but that I did not know how he would receive me. So I did what moral cowardice and false pride suggested was the best thing. I walked deliberately to him, took off my hat, and said, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Yes, said he, with a kind and cordial smile, lifting his cap slightly. So if you've ever wondered where the famous phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume, came from, this is it. However, there is some doubt about whether Stanley actually said this. Whatever the case may be, the phrase is connected with what seemed to be the last great unicorn hunt, because Stanley got to know a man named Harry Hamilton Johnston, and they became friends. Johnston was a British diplomat and an explorer. Lavers writes... In 1883, Johnston penetrated the Congo Basin where he met and befriended Stanley, who was then helping to set up the Congo Free State on behalf of the Belgian King Leopold II. A year later, Johnston was appointed by the Royal Society to lead a scientific mission to the land surrounding Mount Kilimanjaro. 
Few expeditions during the partition of Africa were apolitical, and Johnston's reputation as a sensitive negotiator with Native Africans was as important as his scientific study. He duly struck agreements with the indigenous tribes of the region under which they accepted British protection, essentially from the attentions from other predatory European powers. Johnston's treaties later formed the basis of the British East Africa Protectorate, which brought Kenya and Uganda into Britain's expanding sphere of influence. In 1885, Johnston joined the Foreign Office, and over the next 17 years held administrative and diplomatic posts in Cameroon, the Niger Delta, Mozambique, Tunisia, and Uganda. By the end of his career, he had added 400,000 square miles of Africa to the colonial holdings of the British Empire. For this, he was awarded a pension of 500 pounds per year, about which he was far from happy. And I wouldn't be happy about that either. Uh, 500 pounds was essentially 47,000 pounds today, or about 60,000 American dollars after all the inflation the governments have caused. That may sound that may sound like a lot of money, but the average U.S. household income is about $100,000 today. So $60,000 is only about 60% of the average U.S. family income. And that's not a lot of money to live on, especially if you've established treaties and added almost half a million square miles of territory to the British Empire. So it's understandable Johnston wouldn't be happy. But for purposes of our story, here's the thing. In 1888, Johnston's friend Stanley, the guy who found Livingston, had studied the Mbuti pygmies of the Congo, and they told him about a donkey-like beast called an Addy. Johnston wondered whether this donkey-like, horse-like creature might be the basis of African reports of unicorns. In other words, he wondered whether the Addy might have horns, and in particular, a single horn. He wondered if it might be a unicorn. And in late 1899, he got his chance to find out. At this time, there was a World's Fair known as the Paris Exhibition scheduled to be held in France the next year in 1900. And a German showman had come down to the Congo Free State to try to get some pygmies to come up to France for the show. But he didn't wait to get official permission. And Johnston got word that he was heading up the Nile with 20 to 30 pygmies. We're not sure of the exact number. What we are sure of is that when the pygmies were taken into protective custody, only seven were alive. Johnston was now faced with the task of how to get the pygmies home, and he decided to take them himself. Lavers writes, Johnston was unable to leave for the Congo straight away. There were provisions to organize, porters to employ, and administrative loose ends to deal with, which left the question of what to do with seven frightened pygmies. The solution was simple for someone of Johnston's basic humility and anthropological interests. He put them up at his house. Whose idea it was that they should decamp in his back gardens, history does not record. But one suspects that the choice was theirs. Here, at least, they had constant company. Remarkable birds of prey tethered to stumps, gray parrots in semi-liberty, pythons, puff adders, and other snakes in large wire cages— a young elephant allowed to roam where he liked, and with his companion, a young zebra, well-behaved and not destructive, tame bushbuck, a situtunga, or water-loving tregalof, a baby hippopotamus. When Johnson first welcomed the pygmies to his home, he could communicate with them only in signs, but both parties could speak a spattering of the Bantu trade language of northern Congoland, and the pygmies quickly picked up Swahili. Johnston worked out that his guest's native language was a variation of Mbuba spoken by the taller inhabitants of the Congo forest, but otherwise it seemed to be an unclassified and unstudied dialect. The pygmies and Johnston's combined facility for languages was such that within weeks everyone was communicating freely. This proved useful because before they left, one of the pygmies unfortunately died, which led to a really startling situation. Sensing a scientific opportunity, Johnston gathered the remaining pygmies together to ask their opinions and wishes, and to explain to them how interesting to us was the study of their people, how in the principal town of our empire, London, we had a great house, Natural History Museum, in which we preserved specimens of beasts, birds, reptiles, and fishes from all parts of the world, and how we also tried to illustrate the different types of mankind. Would they have any objection, he continues, to the skeleton of their dead brother being sent on to this great house where the British people could see him and compare him to the skeletons of their own race? 
The Pygmies held a tribal council and decided that they approved of the honor that Johnston proposed to confer on their dead friend. Johnston's brother, Alex, records, My brother got permission to bury the body in an anthill, so that in a very short time the skeleton was ready to be sent to South Kensington Museum, where it is now exhibited. So, uh, wow. Creepy, but science. Johnston now had the task of getting the pygmies back home, where he also hoped to find the unicorn. And on their way back to the pygmies' home village, they had some striking adventures, including Johnston's brother, Alex. Alex found more than he bargained for when he came face to face with the lion, but so did the lion. One look at the strange creature dressed in a sun helmet, blue goggles, and wielding a butterfly net, and the king of the beasts crashed off into the undergrowth. Much as Harry Johnston wanted to stay in this paradise of exotic wildlife, the pygmies were keen to get home. So the party broke camp and marched up the Semleki River to a crossing station, from where they were ferried across in canoes to the Belgian fort of Minbeni. Here Johnston and his companions were greeted by Lieutenant Mira and his Swedish deputy, Mr. Erickson. We settled up the pygmy question, Johnston writes, and the pygmies, it was arranged, should guide me to their home in the forest so that I could see them definitely repatriated. A column of soldiers under the command of Fortman Benny would have sufficed, but Johnson was determined to continue his fascinating quest for new languages and to see the marvelous botany of Stanley's great Congo forest. More than anything, he wanted to find Henry Stanley's forest horse. Moira and Erickson had never seen the animal, but they had heard stories from their pygmy contacts in the forest. According to Harry, they described it as vaguely as being a species of zebra or possibly something more wonderful, a horse with three toes, a still-surviving hipparion. They advised me to enlist the pygmies as guides, and they told me that the direction of their house in the forest would bring me into the region where the animals lived. Zebras are members of the horse family, and like all living horses, they have only one toe on each foot in contact with the ground. Some ancestral horses walked on three toes, the best known in Johnston's time being Hipparion. If a relic population of Hipparion survived in the forest of the Congo, its discovery would be a sensation. Mara supplied Harry with some native soldiers for protection on the onward journey. Like the rest of the local workforce at Membina, they were from plains-dwelling tribes. The thought of striking into the forest, a place that all other circumstances they avoided, clearly made them nervous. But Harry would not be deterred. He reassured the spook soldiers, gathered together his displaced pygmies and excited British national historians, and set off toward the forest. Crossing the border from grassy plain to woodland, Johnston and his companions were enveloped in deep shade. Immense trees creaked in the semi-darkness. A tree hyrax screamed in alarm. In the distance, parrots squawked and monkeys howled. Riding horses through the Aturi forest was impossible. Their hooves sank into the boggy ground and liana vines tangled around their necks. Harry could see why Stanley had enthused about the botany of the forest. Strange ferns, fungi, and delicate orchids clung to trunks and branches. Palms sprouted wherever a little light reached the ground. Grassy glades sprang up where trees had fallen. Lush, slippery moss covered the enormous buttressed roots that snaked across the forest floor. Harry and Mr. Doggett were desperate to see the animals of the forest, but the soldiers were so scared that they chanted and sounded bugles to keep up their courage. Harry could hear exotic creatures calling in the distance and the occasional crash in the undergrowth. But apart from butterflies and a few spiders, all the animals fled before the clamor of his party. Any break from the suffocating heat and darkness was a blessed relief to everyone except the pygmies, who seemed completely at home so long as there were trees nearby. Doggett, Harry, and Alex, and the soldiers instinctively headed for glades streamed in village clearings. By the bank of one stream, the pygmies suddenly huddled together and pointed urgently at the ground. It was the footprint of an ati. His strength and patience sapped by the heat and humidity, Johnston became uncharacteristically angry. The print had been made by an animal with two toes on each foot. Extant horses have one toe per foot. The ancient, extinct horse known as Hipparion had three toes. The footprint was big enough to be that of an eland or some other large cloven-hoofed beast, but it could not be the animal that Johnston was looking for. 
He told the pygmies firmly that he did not want to see any two-toed animals and ordered them back into the sweltering gloom to find him a horse. The pygmies led Johnson to a village where some Congo state soldiers sported waist belts made from the skin of an ati. Johnston immediately bought the belts to send back to London for analysis. The strips were so thin that he could not identify the creature from which they had come, but their appearance convinced him that the ati was worth pursuing. The skin was finely striped. In the video version of the podcast, we'll have pictures of the belts that Johnston sent back, and you can see that they do indeed have fine stripes on them, something like that of a zebra. Johnston could not think of any two-toed animal with such camouflage, but one single-toed creature sprang immediately to mind, the zebra. Perhaps the Ati was a forest-dwelling form of an animal hitherto known only from the open plains. At least Johnston could feel more confident that the Ati was not a two-toed beast. All options were still open, and only one would represent an exciting discovery. The Ati could be a new species of zebra which lived in an atypical environment, a relic population of the ancient horse Superian, no one knows whether these animals are striped, or even a patterned horse with a horn. So maybe it would turn out that the mysterious animal that the pygmies called an Addy would end up being a zebra unicorn, or zebra corn, as some have called it. They would have to wait to find out, though. With the waist belts packed away in his bag, Johnston fell behind the pygmies as they were headed back into the forest. Alex writes, At length we reached a collection of beehive huts made of the leaves of wild plantains, about the height of an ordinary dining room table. It was the pygmy village. Our little friends were transported with delight to regain what was to us an almost uninhabitable abode. They stilled the fears of their kinsfolk by singing the praises of the white man and danced for us in a clearing by moonlight, looking more than ever like elves and gnomes. To go further into the forest without the pygmies would be suicide. Johnston could pay or entreat his little friends to act as guides, but he knew that they wanted to be with their families. And by the time everyone in the party except the pygmies and Harry had fallen ill, mostly with malaria. So they had to turn back. Harry Johnston had some evidence of a new creature in the form of the belts that he sent back to England, but it wasn't enough to count as a true discovery. That was disappointing, and Harry must have been sad. But then, two years later, something tremendous happened. Back in Uganda in 1901, Johnston received a package from Mbeni. Its contents had been brought to the fort by the pygmies and given to Lieutenant Muera. Mayora died of Blackwater fever shortly afterwards, so his assistant, Mr. Erickson, forwarded the parcel. Johnston ripped it open to find two skulls and a complete skin. From the stripes, he knew immediately that he had an ati. So the pygmies that Harry had befriended and taken home had come through. They'd sent him two skulls and a complete hide of the creature that they knew as the Addy. And it, and it was a wonderful discovery. Johnston had never seen such an extravagantly colored mammal. It looked like a bird of paradise. The hooves were missing from the skin, having dropped off the bones of the feet somewhere between the pygmies' village and Mbeni. But even without the hooves, Johnston could see that the Ati was not a zebra. It was not a horse of any kind. The pygmies had been right. The cloven footprints in the riverbank had belonged to an Ati after all. But what sort of animal was it? Johnston was unsure. I knew enough anatomy to realize when I examined the skulls and skin that this beast was a near relation of the giraffe. Now, it turned out that this new creature did not have a single horn, so it was not a unicorn, though the males of the species do have two horn-like structures on their heads. But the discovery of this new animal was still sensational. In addition to Addy, the pygmies also had another name for it, which is Oopi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But that was really hard for many non-pygmies to say, and other tribes had converted that gasping sound into a K sound, and they called the animal the Okapi, which is what it's known as today. And because he was the European who discovered them, Johnston's name was immortalized as part of the scientific name for the Okapi, which is Okapia Johnstoni, or Johnston's Okapi. Okapis do have zebra-like stripes on their butts and their legs, but the rest of their body is solidly colored, like a horse or a donkey. They are related to giraffes, and they're really weird. 
Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault, and you're watching Animal Logic. As you might have guessed from its appearance, the okapi is a member of the giraffe family, and they can only be found in the forests of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okapi measure around 1.5 meters tall at the shoulder, and from head to tail measure around 2.5 meters long. Similar to their much taller cousins, the giraffes, Okapi have little hair-covered horns called ossicones. You may have guessed, but okapi are herbivores. And they primarily eat fruit, grass, and fungi. They live in dense canopy forests and have all sorts of adaptations that help them thrive in their habitat. First off, their stripes. Their hindquarters are covered with white and black stripes. This is to break up the outline of their bodies and make them more difficult to spot in the tree line. Each okapi has a set of stripes that is as unique to them as our fingerprints are to us. Life in the dark of the forest can be pretty difficult. Fortunately, they have a large number of rod cells in their eyes, which give them much better low light vision. Okapi have very long and fuzzy ears, which they can move independently of one another. Coupled with the fact that they have large auditory bullae and auditory lobes in their brains, which give them an enhanced hearing ability, they are excellent at detecting predators stalking them along the dampened forest floor. Okapi also have a fantastic sense of smell, which they use to find other okapi and to detect predators. Their scent glands are located on their feet, and when they want to chemically communicate with other okapi, they will leave behind a sticky substance wherever they walk, marking their territory. Another advantage they have is their infrasonic call. Okapi mothers can produce a 15 kilohertz call to communicate with their calves. A low frequency call in the forest is especially useful when you don't want to be heard by predators. But possibly their most amazing feature is their prehensile tongue. They have long black tongues measuring around 30 centimeters long, which they use to grab leaves off branches to eat and to groom themselves, often washing their eyes and ears. Living in such inaccessible habitats, studying okapis has proven difficult. Okapi are highly elusive, stealthy, and their population numbers are difficult to calculate. The current estimate for their population in the wild ranges from 10,000 to 50,000. Okapi are endangered, and their numbers have declined by almost 50% in the last 25 years. Their biggest threats are deforestation and poaching, both for their skin and meat, with their meat being considered the most valuable bushmeat in the Congo. Okapi are generally solitary animals and only really meet up to breed, which can happen any time of the year. They just ate for a mind-numbing 15 months before giving birth to a single calf, weighing around 30 kilos. The discovery of the okapi is now considered by many to be the outstanding zoological discovery of the 20th century, and okapi turned out to be incredibly valuable among the local tribes. Lavers writes, So prized was its skin among the Bantu that only the chieftain and his family were allowed to sit on it. One limb of okapi hide could buy a wife, and wearing the skin was believed to endow its owner with the cunning of an okapi in evading capture. But still, the okapi was no unicorn, and things were looking really bad for unicorns generally. Multiple explorers had been through different parts of the globe, and nobody had found them. Laver summarizes, In the aftermath of Harry Johnston's Congo quest, all hopes of finding a unicorn evaporated. The world of the early 20th century was too well known. Everest Hook Major Ladder, Nikolai Przerovsky, and Sven Hayden had scoured the wilds of Central Asia and found only stories. The grassy plains around Lake Chad in Africa had been explored, and Ducaray's herds of grazing unicorns had mysteriously vanished. And in spite of Johnston's hopes, Stanley's forest ass turned out to be a short-necked giraffe. Baron Cuvier had said it all in the early 19th century. The sutures between the skull bones of an animal do not give rise to horns. Unicorns cannot exist. By the second quarter of the 20th century, this fact of biology was universally accepted just in time for everyone to be proved wrong. And that's right. Everybody was wrong. Unicorns can exist, and they do. And that's what we'll talk about next episode. Very good. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we leave with the viewers and listeners? Until next time. 
We'll have a link to Chris Laver's book, The Natural History of Unicorns, also uh, both volumes of St. Albert the Great's book on animals, Hildegard of Bingen's book, Physica, my original video on unicorns, uh, information about David Livingston, uh, Henry Stanley, Harry Johnson, and also the Animal Logic video on Okapis. And now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about unicorns and what may be behind all the historical accounts? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks to Rob Mady and Mel Melanie Bettinelli for their voiceover work, as well as to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. Uh, you can check out their work by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, be sure to like and comment on the videos because that tells YouTube you were engaged by them. And so it should show them to other people too. That way you can help the channel grow. Also, I am trying to grow the channel, so please subscribe and also hit the bell notification so that you get notified whenever I have a new video. Usually I have multiple videos coming out per week now, so I'd really appreciate it and thank you. So Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be looking at the mysteries that we set up this week, including what could be behind the cave painting of the unicorns, uh, what could be behind the ancient carvings of bull-like unicorns, what could be behind the reports of goat-like unicorns? What could be behind the Bible's mention of unicorns? What could be behind the reports of Roman authors like Pliny the Elder? What could be behind the story of virgins taming unicorns? And what could be behind the alicorns or unicorn horns that appeared in Europe? All right. Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World Bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. Be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt like I'm wearing in the video or a mug or more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 316. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by... Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>